Good evening and welcome to Monsters Among Us. I am your guide, Derek Hayes. Hello everyone and welcome back to the broadcast. I have one hell of a show lined up for you this evening. All sorts of ghosts, creatures, and strange phenomena. And I can't thank you enough for allowing me and my library of listener-submitted stories into your life. And I mean this when I say, I hope the next hour is as terrifying for you as it is entertaining. And the best way to ensure a spook fest is to get right into it. So, kicking us off this evening is our young caller from the state of Illinois. Welcome to the program, Vivian. Hello, my name is Vivian. I am 10 years old and I live in Montgomery, Illinois. I'm calling about an experience I had about I don't know, maybe a year ago or so from this call. It was about the second week of August, and I was up in my mom's room watching TV, and my mom said, look out the window, you can see the backyard. And in the backyard, I have this climbing set. It's about nine feet tall. And so I was in my mom's room watching TV, and I see this big white bird. It was unlike anything that I've ever seen before. And there's a lot of different bigger birds in Illinois. I don't know if you know, but it was very big. So I paused my show and I went over to the window and I saw it sitting on the top of my climbing set. It had white feathers. It wasn't really feathers. It was more like white and gray, really thin fur. And... It was maybe four to four and a half feet tall, sitting on this nine-foot playset at the top of it. So I don't know how big the wingspan was, but we have bald eagles in the area and falcons sometimes, but it was unlike anything that I've ever seen. We also have hawks, but it was almost the height of me. It had kind of a pointed face. It had a small beak, but it more its face kind of was a bit dislocated and came out kind of from the side. And then I thought at first, I was like, oh, maybe it's a very large owl. But then I thought, oh, well, it can't be an owl because owls have very big eyes and its eyes are probably, I don't know, maybe six centimeters wide. But again, I'm just estimating because I was not very up close. And it looked like it had either white eyes or gray eyes. And it had very thick feet. Like compared to a normal bird, its feet were like almost a foot wide. Feet were very wide and large. And I noticed that it had four claws on each of its feet which I feel like is a bit un- unusual because most of the birds in this area only have three. And then I saw that it kind of just hovered without its wings and just went up. I don't know which direction it went in, but I love the podcast. And thank you so much for letting me share my story, and I hope I can get back to you. Bye. Thank you, Vivian. And thank you for all those details that you included. It's because of those details that I may have stumbled upon an explanation for the creature that Vivian saw. You see, there's a bird called the Stellar Sea Eagle. It's massive. It has an eight-foot wingspan. And believe me when I tell you this bird is as big as it is beautiful. Now this jumbo liner of a raptor normally lives in the northern reaches of the planet. But 
A couple of years back, a particular specimen set out for a North American tour. This particular stellar sea eagle has had quite a journey. Uh, so it's kind of like a COVID eagle. It's believed to first have been sighted in Alaska in August of 2020. And that was a pretty rare sighting. But then <laughs> a bird that we think was the same bird was spotted in, um, in Texas, which is extremely unusual. We're talking 5,000 miles off course. It was later seen in Quebec and New Brunswick. Right before Christmas, it showed up in Massachusetts, which was the first confirmed sighting of this species ever reported in the lower 48. Uh, it showed up uh, as a little late, New, almost like a New Year's Eve present to Maine birders, and there it was in um, near Georgetown, Maine. How do we know it's the same bird? Some bird species have, like, well, especially when they're this big, we see coloration on their body and we see distinct markings. So this bird has this particular spot, I believe it's on the left wing, like a white spot after its big white patch and then its dark brownish black wings. And plus, it's just so rare. The odds of seeing two of them would be even crazier. And that clip courtesy of News Center, Maine. And we, of course, cannot be certain about these dates. But going by the info in the video and the estimated date given by Vivian, that could put that very eagle passing through that portion of the country at around that same time. Could that be what Vivian saw climbing on her playset? Well, I'll be the first to admit that the physical description she gave doesn't exactly match that of the Stellar's eagle. For those of you that I know won't look it up, picture a bald eagle, but instead of a white head and tail, the stellar sea eagle has white bands down the top of each wing and white legs almost as if it's wearing a pair of pants. The rest of the bird is that dark brown or black color that it shares with its cousin, the bald eagle. So, as you can hear, not an exact fit. But I must point out that the state in which Vivian had this encounter, Illinois, is well known for sightings of unusually large birds. In Alton, Illinois, there once sat a petroglyph painted upon a cliff overlooking the Mississippi River that depicted the Piasaw, a massive bird-like creature said to prey on men in the area. A reproduction can be found in that spot today. And in July of 1977, former combat photographer Chief A.J. Huffer captured two unusually large birds on 16mm film. That video, filmed near Lake Shelbyville, Illinois, is still controversial to this day. A link to it and all other clips discussed this evening can be found in the show notes. Then later that same month, July of 1977, something terrifying took place in the tiny town of Lawndale, Illinois. July 25th, 1977. One thousand four, one thousand five, one thousand. I was in my backyard one day playing hide and seek with a couple friends of mine, Willie and Travis. Marlon Lowe is ten years old and weighs about sixty pounds. One thousand nine, one thousand ten. Ready or not, here I come. I run around the house. Suddenly, something descends upon him from above. Something just swooped down and grabbed me. I didn't hear it, didn't smell it, didn't see nothing coming. So I looked up and I seen a big old bird. According to Lowe, the bird uses its long, curved talons to grasp the sleeves of his tank top and lift him at least a foot into the air. Marlon's mother, Ruth, sees the attack from the house. Oh, my mom, she took off at me when she seen it. She took off running at me. Marlon struggles to free himself. Already, the bird has carried him a distance of nearly 40 feet. And it dropped me, and when it dropped me, I just took off running. Marlon and four other witnesses watch, stunned, as the bird flies off. Now that clip from the classic Birdzilla episode of Monster Quest. And let that sink in a bit, Vivian. Both encounters took place in the state of Illinois. And both incidents happened when the witness was roughly 10 years old. Given that information, I'd say it's probably a good thing you decided to stay inside. Thanks again, Vivian, for taking the time to share. Now, if you think you know what Vivian saw that day, or you just have a true paranormal story to tell of your own, simply call the hotline at 1-888-608-NIGHT 
That's 1-888-608-6444. Now this next one is, well, creepy, to say the least. Please welcome Carlos from California to the show. Hey, Derek, this is Carlos calling from South Bay over in uh, Southern California. I was listening to your episode, season 12, episode 5, about the uh, haunted dolls. Mine wasn't actually a doll. It was more of a toy, actually. My nephews visit me every... They visit me twice a month. And for some reason, I had a dream one night about a, a Buzz Lightyear actually choking me. And I knew it was a dream because I woke up and I said, what the heck is going on? And something told me to go check underneath the bed, though. And uh, I saw a Buzz Lightyear toy underneath the bed. And it just seemed very strange to me that a toy would be there because I'm a neat freak. So I make sure I always clean underneath my bed. I make sure I clean my whole house. So that was kind of strange. And uh, mind you, my siblings had not visited me in the last week. So I knew the toy couldn't have been there for more than a week. Because, like I said, I'm a neat freak. It just seemed a very strange thing to me that I would have a dream that a Buzz Lightyear was choking me and then something told me to look underneath and then the Buzz Lightyear toy was underneath the bed. Was it a Toy Story thing? I don't know, but just thought I'd call on that. Thank you. Thank you, Carlos. Where's that Sid kid when you need him? Talk about a bizarre experience. And we've certainly heard of possessed dolls in the past. Robert and Annabelle are two names that come to mind. Now, I suppose a doll is a doll, regardless of the material that it's made up of. So if Robert and Annabelle can be possessed, why not Buzz Lightyear? But the question I have is, how did old Buzz get quote-unquote possessed in the first place? If that is what's going on, of course. Thank you again, Carlos, for sharing that wild tale. Oh, if it happens again... Try telling them that Andy's coming. Now I interrupt this blood-curdling broadcast with a special announcement. It's official. I'm revamping Monsters Among Us Beyond, the Patreon-exclusive episodes that we run each month. Now I don't have many details for you just yet, but I can tell you that you'll be soon getting twice the content and on a weekly basis. And included in those changes is a small price increase. But today is your lucky day. Because you can still join the $4 level today through May 1st and be grandfathered into that price until you cancel. So once again, you have until May 1st to sign up and get grandfathered into that $4 level. And more info on the changes coming next week. Now speaking of Patreon... Our next caller was once a guest on Monsters Among Us Beyond, where we did a deep dive into her experience with a Sasquatch while trucking through the state of Montana. Well, she also told the following story there, a story that I simply had to share with you. So please, join me in welcoming Mickey from Oregon back to the program. Now folks, a trigger warning here. There is some discussion of domestic violence in this call. Hi, everybody. This is Mickey from Springfield, and I'm calling in the story that Derek and I discussed on the Deep Dive episode. I was married to a man for nine years and lived in California, and he was extremely violent, and he had threatened my life and my three children's lives and then to kill himself, so I had left him. And I went to Pennsylvania. My parents had moved there uh, three months before or something like that. And so I moved to Pennsylvania and I rented an old house. It was at least half a mile from the nearest house and um, it was near Beaver, Pennsylvania. And it was in the woods and there was a cave across the street and I'd seen bear tracks and everything. So it was, it was country <laughs> and wild and there was just one little road that went by it, and there was a creek going through the yard, and it was nice. I mean, it was nice for kids and everything. So let me describe the house. Half the house was built in probably 1905, I think. And the other half of the house, there were two bedrooms and two rooms downstairs that were new. The kitchen, the basement, and two of the bedrooms upstairs, and two rooms downstairs were all 
the old part of the house. The old part of the house had really saggy floors, and in the basement, there was a dirt floor. There were no windows in there or anything. There were two big oil tanks to heat the house, and just a bare bulb and a couple of shelves with uh, what I assumed was moonshine. It was clear liquid in canning jars on a shelf, but there was no entrances to the basement that I could see anywhere. And the only reason I ever went down there was to check the tank levels. So, the upstairs rooms, I had taken a new room, and my girls were in a new room, and then my, my son was in one of the old rooms. But the other old room, the other old bedroom, was super spooky and had a really saggy floor. And I was afraid to let the kids play in there. And anyway, in the closet, there were a bunch of old man's canes and belts. And there must have been 20 canes laying in the corner of the closet in that room. And I had locked the room. I locked it from the inside. It had one of those latch locks with a spring, so it couldn't easily be unlocked. And so I locked it from the inside. And then there was a little bathroom that connected the two bedrooms that was across the stairway. And I had gone into the room, locked it from the inside, and then went to the bathroom and locked that. It had a deadbolt and then a latch lock at the top. It was kind of high, so the kids would have had to get a stool to unlock it. And at one point I was in my room. It was not quite light yet. It was dawn. It was kind of getting light, but not light yet. And I heard footsteps on the stairs and the stairs creaked when you walked up them and I, it was creaking. And, and so I assumed that my son, who was six at the time, had been downstairs and was coming up the stairs. So I could see the top of the stairs from where I was laying and I could see my son's bedroom door and my daughter's bedroom door and I was expecting him to walk into his room well the footsteps got to the top of the stairs and then that door that was locked opened and then shut and so I, I jumped out of bed and I went in there and my son was asleep in his bed and so I opened that door which I had locked just a few days before and it opened easily and there was nobody in there. So that's the first thing that happened. Well then, I couldn't really afford that place anymore. It wasn't the rent, it was the heating bill that was ridiculous. And my income was extremely limited at the time. So I had an apartment in town to move to and I had packed up everything this one night. This was about a month after the first thing. I had packed up everything and I had taken the kids bed down and gotten it all ready to move and my dad was going to come with a trailer and a couple of kids from his neighborhood to help move the next morning so everything was in boxes and it was probably midnight or so and the kids were all asleep in my bed so i went upstairs and i laid across the end of my bed to go to sleep and as soon as my head hit the bed I heard a huge bang downstairs, huge. And so I, I jumped up and I ran downstairs and I could hear something in the basement. It sounded like scrabbling like an animal. Like, I don't know, I, what I imagined was it was a raccoon or something like that. And I'm thinking, how could it get in there? Because the only way that I could see it could get in there was through the vents from the heater. And they were, yeah, I mean, they were metal. So coming through them would have been difficult. So I'm thinking, how on earth did it get in there, and what am I going to do? So I'm kind of standing at the doorway, listening to the scrabbling sounds, and then suddenly it started up the stairs. And as it did, it seemed to get bigger and bigger, like the scrabbling turned to stomping. And I had taken my garbage and put it at the top of my stairs in bags because the raccoons would get into it outside so garbage day was the next day and so there was three bags of garbage at the top of the basement stairs and there was just a little latch on the outside of that basement door so this whatever's in the basement is coming up these stairs and it's stomping and then i hear, hear it start to snarl like an animal and i'm thinking what could it be you know and i'm thinking well that's not that's not a raccoon and I'm thinking 
bear or large dog. I don't know, but it got to the top of the stairs and then I hear it ripping these bags open. I hear the ripping and I hear cans and bottles just bouncing down the stairs. And I'm standing there completely unarmed and then it starts to scratch at the door. And I, I imagine these huge claws just trying to scratch the door and the snarling is getting louder. So I ran to my kitchen, which was right there, and I grabbed a knife in one hand and the phone, which, you know, back then we didn't have cordless phones. It had a long cord on it. And I ran and stood back in front of the door with this knife and the phone. And I dialed my mother's number because what are you going to do? You can't call the cops. What are you going to do? So I dialed my mother's number and I said, there's something in the basement. It's going to come through the door. And she said, get the kids, get in the car and come to my house. So I ran up the stairs. I dropped the phone and the knife. I didn't even hang up. But I ran up the stairs. I grabbed all three of my kids. I, they were two, four, and six years old. I grabbed them all three up in my arms with the blanket and ran back down the stairs as fast as I could go. And it's a wonder I didn't trip with all of them. And I put everybody in the car and I, I left the door open. I just left. And so I get to my mother's house and she meets me on the doorstep with, you know, she had a Valium in one hand and a glass of whiskey in the other. And she goes, take this, wash it down with this and go to bed. I'll get the kids. So <laughs> I went to bed. <laughs> so I, um, you know, I was under a lot of stress. I got to say I was under a lot of stress and I'm thinking I'm losing my mind. But I really thought there was something in there. And I thought by the time we got to my mom's house, they would probably rip through the door and the whole house is going to be a mess. And trashed and whatever you know i i thought it was an animal a huge animal so i went with my dad the next morning my mom kept my kids and we went back to the house to get my stuff and when we walked in there he had heard the whole story we walked in there i'm standing behind him like a little kid i'm crouched behind him while he's opening the basement door and he opens the door and there's nothing amiss at all the bags of garbage were still at the top of the stairs. They were not ripped. The door was not scratched. There was nothing there. And I fainted. I just, I just literally fell over and painted. And um, when I came to, my dad's looking all concerned. And I'm thinking, he doesn't believe me now. And he thinks I'm crazy. And I thought I was crazy. But then I got back to my mom's house and talked to her. And she said she heard it. She heard it over the phone. She heard it snarling and, and everything. So I don't know if I'm crazy, but that's one of the things that totally makes me question my sanity. And um, it's the worst thing that ever happened to me. I gotta tell you. And I have no explanation for it whatsoever. So yeah, thanks for listening to my story. Take care. Goodbye. That story gets spookier and spookier every time I hear it. Thank you, Mickey. Now for those unfamiliar, Beaver, Pennsylvania is a little northwest of Pittsburgh. Certainly an area rich in history and tragedy. Death and suffering were experienced on several occasions in that area in both the French and Indian War and later the Revolutionary War. So perhaps some of that bad energy has somehow lingered on perhaps in the form of a hulking, snarling beast in Mickey's basement. Thanks again, Mickey, for sharing that amazing entry. Tonight's episode is brought to you by NordVPN. If you think the monsters you find in the forest are frightening, wait until you meet the ones online. Like everyone, I spend a lot of time on the internet, and I take my virtual security and privacy very seriously. And that is why I use NordVPN. NordVPN provides the protection I need to browse the internet safely and anonymously and protect my data from, well, pretty much everyone. It's super easy to use. I connect in one click and I don't even notice it's there. In fact, it's been confirmed by Speedtest to be the fastest VPN on the market. And I can use it on up to six devices. I have it on both my studio computers, Sarah's computer, and our mobile devices for across-the-board protection. I can also use it to switch my virtual location and access streaming content from over 59 countries. 
That's endless binging. <laughs> so get cybersecurity and access to worldwide entertainment for just the price of a cup of coffee each month. Grab your exclusive NordVPN deal by going to nordvpn.com forward slash MAU. Or use coupon code MAU to get a huge discount off your NordVPN plan. Plus one month free. Plus, they're throwing in an additional bonus gift. It's completely risk-free with Nord's 30-day money-back guarantee. So what do you have to lose? Once again, that's nordvpn.com forward slash MAU to grab your exclusive discount. One month free plus a bonus gift. Remember, supporting our sponsors supports the show. So thank you for listening and back to the chill-inducing entries. Well, I think it's high time we get a little otherworldly. For that, please welcome Tom, all the way from the UK. Or I suppose Vietnam, depending on how you look at it. Hey Derek, my name's Tom, I'm from the United Kingdom. Currently recording this uh, voice memo in Vietnam, currently traveling. But anyway, big fan of the show. I'd feel like I'm maybe similar to you in that I want to believe, but I am, I am a skeptic. But nonetheless, I feel that if you talk to enough people, a good percentage of the population has uh, has had encounters of various things that they uh, can't explain or rationalize. All the ones I'm going to share with you in this clip are UFO related, both from around, I couldn't tell you when, honestly, but over 10 years ago. The first was around the time we had first bought a video camera, and this was a fun kind of new toy at the time. So we do actually have footage of this thing on video somewhere. It's a very old video camera, so uh, I'm not sure whether I'll be able to find it again. But I distinctly remember my dad, I think, was with me at the time, filming a kind of silver cylinder that stayed motionless in the sky. This is in the middle of the day, in an urban area, and it just kind of hung there. I don't remember it flying off or anything. I think at some point, you just, you know, we lost interest kind of went away and then it had gone. What's quite strange about this is, I don't remember us being particularly perturbed by it at the time. You know, there's no record of this on the news or anything from the time. Don't really remember anyone else saying it, but we absolutely for sure somewhere have a video of this uh, silver thing kind of off in the distance, just hanging there. So yeah, no idea what that was. The other one was, I want to say a few years later, and we just had a family barbecue. This was in the summer. It was in that lovely time of day after the sun has set, but there's still a fair amount of residual light. And I recall looking up at the sky, just happened to look up at the right moment and saw, I don't know, it's difficult to describe, but it's a sort of like uh, a shimmering light that briefly made itself visible and moved kind of diagonally from a southeast to northwest. And this was maybe less than a second this happened. It was almost almost as if something had briefly made itself visible. And, you know, I'm, I'm very open to the idea of it being a meteorite or, you know, some kind of space junk burning up in the atmosphere. But looking at videos of that kind of thing, it's just never really looked the same. I've got other friends who have experienced uh, much stranger stuff than I have, so maybe I'll get them to call in or Maybe I'll share their stories for them in the future. But for now, that's all. Anyway, love the show. Keep doing what you're doing. Peace and love. Bye. Thanks, Tom. Of course, the UK, the location of Tom's sighting, is no stranger to strange activity in the skies. The Warmeister Lights, the Lake and Heath Bentwaters Base incident, and of course, the craft witnessed in Rendlesham Forest all those infamous cases come to mind. So, Tom, it seems that you're in good company. Plenty of strangeness over the British skies. I wonder if you do find that footage. Be sure to send it in if you can. Now, this next one is a bit on the lengthy side, but I think it's well worth it. Have you guys ever heard of a slider. Hi there. I'm calling in with a story. 
I actually, I just listened to your medical personnel episode and it made me think of this because, not because of medical personnel, but because of the stories from all of the nurses who talked about electronics and machinery going off. I'm going to stay anonymous because the story is actually not about me. It's about my two-year-old son. He's very, very bright. He's very, very special. And he has, I don't know quite how to describe it, but he has had a thing uh, with electricity or electronics since he was a baby. There's two big examples, but one, you know, some of these little things that happen like one time I, I went up into his bedroom and uh, his sound machine, which is on a table n- nowhere near his crib, was off. And I looked at him and I said, oh, that's funny. How did that go off? And he said, well, mom, I turned it off. And I said, well, baby, how did you turn it off? It's all the way over here. And he kind of looked at me like he didn't understand the question. And he said, well, mama, I just I just turned it off. There's another time where I walked into our bedroom and he was standing there in the in the middle of the room with his little bright eyes looking up at the ceiling and just standing there and staring. And, you know, I went in and I said, you know, what you doing, love? And he looked at me and he said, Mama, the smoke detector knows everything, which was a little Twin Peaksy for me. But, you know, I was like, OK, um, and another time where uh, I went up to his room to get him in the morning and I said, you know, how did you sleep, love? And and he said, oh, there was a lot of fook uh, in the camera last night. We have a video monitor, so there's a camera hanging up next to his crib. And I said, well, what's fook? Like fook, like F-O-O-K. You know, he, he's very articulate and he, he actually talks really well, but every now and then I don't understand he's trying to say it. And he said, well, it's just fook, mama. And I said, well, honey, what is fook? Is it, was it a light? Was it smoke? You know, what color was it? And he just kept saying, mama, it's just fook. And so a friend of mine who's very into this stuff said, you know, fook is probably something he can see or he can sense that we can't. And so there is no way to describe it. It's not smoke. It's not a color. It's not light. It's fook. So the two kind of uh, big events were when he had just turned a year old and my partner and I were looking to invest in some real estate. So we would get together and we'd go look at properties that could be flipped and turned into a rental. And I took him with me one day and we were walking around and this place was fine. It was pretty nondescript. Clearly a, a woman had lived there and he was being very much himself, which is, you know, looking around, laughing, giggling, you know, just happy, happy, happy. We went home and the real estate agent called us right after we got home because we said, well, you know, we're really actually interested in getting more information about this place. And she called us later that night and she said, well, that is actually, it's actually not on the market yet, which I think she had told us that before too. She said, it's not on the market yet. The family just called me. They're putting it up for sale. The daughter is the one who lived in it and she passed away suddenly, I think like maybe just last week or, or a couple of weeks ago. And they just want to sell it fast. They just want to get it off their hands. And the hair on the back of my neck really stood up um, just because it was, I mean, that's a creepy situation in the first place. We are walking around in this dead woman's house, not having any idea that she had passed. I mean, it looked like she was just going to come home from work at the end of the day. And so I, I was rocking him to sleep that night. And, I, you know, I have a certain amount of belief. And I kind of said out into the universe, you know, I'm really sorry to hear what happened to you. You had a really beautiful home. I hope it was okay that we were in there. I don't know. I just kind of felt like I needed to acknowledge. So anyway, so we went to sleep, woke up the next morning and went up to his room, my son's room. And we took videos of him all the time because our families both lived far away. And the morning after we were in this recently passed away woman's home, I was filming a video of my son crawling, playing, just being a little one-year-old. And I stopped filming and I looked at the video. You know, I was going to look at it before I sent it. I think I was going to send it to my dad or something. And the video was doing something I have never seen an iPhone video do before. It's very hard to explain. I'm going to email in a clip of the video and I'm going to try to, it'll be much shorter because I don't want you to be able to see my son's face 
but just to give a sense of what it was doing, it was almost like, it looked like a fun house mirror. There was this kind of, <laughs> like, I almost would picture it going, wah, 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 wah. Like, it, it, it just, it was distorted in this way that I, I had never seen before. And it, my phone had never done it before and had never done it. It's never done it since. And so I'm looking at this video and I said to my partner, yeah, this is super weird. Do you want to come look at this? Come look at this. And so she comes over, she sits down, she starts looking at it. And when I opened the video the second time, her phone, which was sitting on the other side of the room, started playing this music. <laughs> and it was not music that was programmed into her phone. It was this old timey kind of carnival music almost like like this kind of do 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 and we're watching this video that's going wah 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 and we're listening this music is coming out of her phone and and my son is just laughing hysterically i mean he's laughing his ass off in the middle of the room and i was super freaked out and you know of course my part was like what the hell is going on and then just like that it all stopped the video i dug it up on my google photos and i'm going to send it in and I'd actually be very curious to hear your, if somebody has a theory about why it was doing that. You know, I Googled it. There's things about, oh, well, your stabilizer or something in your phone can, can malfunction or, you know, there may be a perfectly rational explanation. But the fact that those two things together, you know, directly after this experience in this woman's house, I mean, it was it was very weird. So then one more quick one. About three months later, we went to visit my in-laws in Florida. And my childhood home, my dad had still lived there for a long time. Anyway, long story short, the bank repossessed it. And um, it was very, very sad. And there were a lot of feelings attached to it. it was, I was angry. I was sad. I was upset. And we were in the spare room. And I was changing my son's diaper. And my mother-in-law had... If you were a child of the 90s, you would know these things. They're called touch lamps. It's like a brass lamp, and it was like the coolest thing because you just, if you touched it anywhere on the metal, it would turn it on and off or whatever. And back in the day, that was like, you know, the height of technology. And of course, my mother in law still has her touch lamp from the 90s, and I was looking at it, and it, it was causing a lot of feelings in me because we had a touch lamp at my house. Um, and this is almost exactly the same one. And so I'm kind of absentmindedly changing his diaper, and I'm staring at this lamp, and he's looking at me, and he's looking at the lamp, and just like that, the lamp goes off. And it came back on in a second, and it went off again. It came on, it flickered. This went on for. 45 seconds maybe just on off on off and as I was standing there looking at it and again okay so my son once again is waving his arms around and just cracking up and once it, it was like after it had been doing it for a few seconds it almost didn't even seem weird it almost seemed like normal I just stood there and watched this thing so you know I changed the diaper you know came out whatever Fast forward about an hour or two, and I had put him down to sleep, and we had the video monitor. You know, we'd take it with us when we travel, and I look in the room, and the touch lamp is on. And I, I just went in, and I kind of pulled out, there was like a day bed in front of the plug, and I unplugged it. I just unplugged the lamp and left the room, and I came out, and I said to my mother-in-law, I said, yeah, oh, hey, I just want to give you the heads up. I unplugged that touch lamp. It was kind of being kind of fritzy, assuming that, you know, it was it was old and probably something that happened all the time. And she just looked at me like I had two heads and said, what do you mean, Fritzy? And I said, well, it's kind of going on and off. And she said, huh, well, that's weird. It's never done that before. So I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> anyway, about two in the morning, uh, we were sleeping in the room right next to where my son was and my partner snores and was snoring. So I got up and went to sleep on that day bed in my son's room. And I'm, I'm kind of laying there still feeling very, still having a lot of feelings about what happened with my childhood home and sort of started kind of fuming as I was laying there. And I swear to God, the electricity in the entire house blew out and it there was this pop and a flash and everything went dark. And I was just 
frozen. I was just paralyzed. And my son wasn't making any noises or anything. I mean, he was fine. He was in his playpen, you know, sleeping right next to the bed. I mean, I could see him. He didn't move or anything. But the timing of it was just uncanny. And so by the time we woke up the next morning, I don't know, I'm sure I laid awake for a while, freaking out, and eventually dozed off. I woke up and the electricity had come back on. And same deal. I came out and I said, hey, you know, oh, yeah, you know, did you know we lost the electricity last night? Thinking, you know, they live in Florida, they live on the coast. Maybe, again, maybe this is something that happens to them often. And my mother-in-law said, yeah, you know, that's the first time we've lost electricity in this house since we moved here six years ago. There's a lot of other little tiny anecdotes like that. But, my God, I've gone on for almost 15 minutes with just these it, it might actually be really interesting to do an episode of this kind of phenomenon because I think it's something, you know, that happens to people quite often. And whether you are a believer or not, some people really do believe that spirits or the energy in the universe can kind of manipulate these electronics. And I think that my son is just somehow he's connected to it. Yeah, so I wanted to share that story. Yeah. Uh, thanks for your, your show. I've been binging it for about a week. I just discovered it, um, and I'm I'm just going through the whole catalog. I love it. Okay. Well, anyway, thanks a lot. Bye. Thank you, caller. Per usual, I was not able to find the email with the video that you described. I get tons of emails, so locating one without certain pieces of information is near impossible. But that said... Send it back in and I'll be sure to keep my eyes open for it. I really enjoy stories like this. It's almost like modern wizardry. As I alluded to in the caller's introduction, this phenomenon is so widely known that there's even a nickname for it. Actually, there are several names. They call it streetlight interference, or a play on that, sliders. The first three letters making up the acronym. And as I learned researching this entry, folks in the know also sometimes referred to it as high voltage syndrome. And many people claim to suffer from it. Perhaps one woman more so than others. Behold the tale of Jacqueline Priestman, the electric woman. This story begins in the 1980s. Jacqueline Priestman was a woman who lived in Manchester. She lived a normal life with her husband until he died in a tragic accident. After the accident, strange phenomenons began to occur in Jacqueline's home. One morning, Jacqueline was taking a shower when the light bulb in the bathroom exploded and the glass shards cut her bare skin. Since then, electrical appliances in the home began to malfunction. Every time she entered a room and turned on the light, the bulbs would blink and then explode. Her vacuum cleaner stopped working after she touched it. The radios and television stopped working when she got near them. Jacqueline believed she had bad luck because this did not only happen in her home, it happened everywhere she went. Jacqueline said that the situation was so grave that some stores banned her from entering for fear that she might damage the electronics. Now that segment was pulled from a video by Hypnos Morpheo on YouTube. The full video goes into much more detail, but essentially she later learns that she's unable to discharge collected static electricity. So she removed her carpets and began utilizing static-free clothing and products. And apparently that helped. But I don't know, caller. Jacqueline's case and your son's although similar on the surface, really seem to be separate issues. And keep us updated, if you will. I'd certainly love to hear of any future odd happenings. And might I suggest keeping a paranormal journal of sorts? Just a short log of every odd occurrence that you notice. You can certainly learn a lot from a good list. Anyway, it's incredible stuff. And thank you again, caller, for sharing it. Tonight's episode is brought to you by Manscaped. Spring has sprung and our friends at Manscaped have made the best tools for some spring cleaning on yourself. 
It's time to clear out that winter bush and join the other 4 million men who trust Manscaped. Use code MONSTERS to get 20% off plus free shipping at manscaped.com. As longtime listeners may know, I'm a huge fan of Manscaped, and they've forever changed my grooming game with their amazing performance package 4.0. Inside the Superior Bundle, you'll find their Lawnmower 4.0 trimmer, equipped with their proprietary skin safe technology and an LED light. Did I mention it's also waterproof? Also included is the Weed Whacker Nose and Ear Hair Trimmer. The skin safe technology helps reduce nicks, snags, and tugs in those delicate nose and ear holes. And the Performance Package 4.0 doesn't stop there. Also included is the Crop Preserver, an anti chafing ball deodorant and deodorizer that will keep you smelling and feeling phenomenally clean. And the Crop Reviver Toner, which keeps your downstairs from sweating, smelling, and sticking. Now, as if Manscaped didn't already have me feeling like a whole new man, they also tossed in a few free gifts. A pair of performance boxer briefs that are the softest I've ever felt, and a high-quality travel bag to store all of my grooming goodies. So, whether you're the big man ready to emerge from your lair after a long winter, or you're looking for a gift to pamper your Sasquatchy significant other, get 20% off and free shipping with the code MONSTERS at manscaped.com. That's 20% off with free shipping at manscaped.com with the code MONSTERS. Now, as always, supporting our sponsor supports the show. So thank you for listening. Now back to the stuff that keeps us up at night. Well, that brings us to our final entry of the evening. Unless you're in the know, of course. And boy, do I have a creepy one for you. So join me in a journey to the Buckeye State of Ohio. Truman, welcome to the program. Hey Derek, my name's Truman. I'm a fellow Ohioan, go Bucks, specifically from the northeast part of Ohio. Um, I just listened to James's story from season nine, episode 13, about the possible white creature that he saw, and I thought it was finally time for me to call in. This happened in 2013 or 2014, I'm not exactly sure, but I know it was in, I think, mid-July. My best friend's parents own about 40 acres in Northeast Ohio. It's kind of split halfway between the Pennsylvania border and Cleveland, but that's all I'll say. And we used to have bonfires there all the time. So the front kind of 15 or 40 acres is all open field and and grass. And uh, they lease the backfield out for corn or for soybeans, you know, depending on whatever they're growing this year. And that, this year it was corn. And then back further, the property is all wooded. And then there's kind of wood lines running down both sides of it. So if you're looking at it from the front, kind of, I just want to explain this. There's the house to the left and then a barn and then kind of a field. And then that field to the right, we would always have bonfires all the time, every all summer long, three, four times a week, every weekend when we were in school. So that field is to the north, and we were facing to the north. So we're facing the fire, and then about 50 yards away, there's a wood line. And then behind us, about 100 yards, is the house. And then back to the left of us, about 50 yards, is the barn. And then straight to our left, to the west, it was corn, and the corn was pretty tall, actually. It was probably five or six feet. And so we're sitting there at this bonfire, and it kind of started out, you know, how every night does. Just, we went out there at dark and just started it up and just kind of burning whatever and sitting there talking. And we were probably, I think, smoking some cigars and maybe having a beer or two. I don't really... I think maybe we weren't, but I can't remember. Now, we're facing the fire and facing north, facing this wood line about, maybe it's about 40 yards away. And back to our right, kind of behind us, and probably 150 yards down their driveway, it was a long, long driveway, there is a light pole. There's like a te- it's like a telephone pole with a light on it. So there's some ambient light, and the fire was sort of big, but not so big. So there's a little bit of light, and I can't remember if there was moon or not. It seemed pretty dark otherwise. And so... At about 10.30, I think it was, we kind of started to notice something in the trees in front of us. And we kind of both weren't sure if we were even seeing this. 
I forgot to preface with this too. You know, I've known my best friend for 20 years. He's a couple years older than I am. We did everything together. We trust each other implicitly. So we're both there and we're kind of seeing this, I don't know, like a shape or something. It's kind of coming out of the trees and then running in the field and then going back into the trees. Left to right, right to left. Sometimes for 25 yards, sometimes for 5 yards, sometimes for longer than that, shorter than that. It was very strange, and we kept seeing this, and I, I said to my best friend, I said, do you see that? And he goes, yeah. You see that too? And I said, yeah. It's weird, what is that? And he said, I don't know. And we kind of just kept watching it for, I don't know, 10 or 15 minutes. And we kind of started to think it was, we both thought separately, without saying anything, we found this out later from each other, that we both kind of thought it was maybe a coyote? Because it was white, whitish, you know, very light gray, whitish in color. It was very, very noticeable against basically the black background of the forest. We could see some definition in the forest, but it once you go back in there, it's very thick. So you can only see about the front foot of the trees and everything, especially since it was so dark. And really the only light was coming from the fire, which had kind of died down at this point. And then the street light that was 150 yards away. And we're both kind of getting this like weird feeling from this. We kind of couldn't explain it. And I don't know, it just kept doing this. And some of this is kind of like a blur to me, but at one point it just kind of came out and stopped and it stood up on two legs. It was the, the, it was the weirdest thing I had ever seen in my whole life. And I'll say that you know, before that, I was I was kind of a believer in Bigfoot. I, I don't know, I guess I kind of enjoyed the subject, but after this, I became a knower, and I became fascinated with the subject. But this thing walks out, and it stands up on two legs. And at this point, my heart is beating through my chest, and my best friend and I, were scared. We don't know what this is. And I think at this point, we had jumped up out of our camping chairs, and they had fallen to the ground, and this thing stood up, and it seemed like it was a long time, but I don't think it was. I, it couldn't have been more than five seconds, maybe less, maybe two seconds. And it looked right at us. Now, we couldn't really see the face, but we saw kind of the general shape of it. It was big. It was very big. We went back to measure a tree that was above its head and the tree was about eight feet so we think it was about seven seven and a half feet somewhere in there it had lighter colored fur it was white or, or dark light gray or darkish white i don't that really doesn't make any sense but it was light and then it was very i i remember it being very muscular not built like patty at all very muscular but like muscular like a runner kind of like a basketball player but still kind of built and at this point it's just we're feeling extreme fear and i think this thing stood up and looked at us for three to five seconds maybe and it took off to our left it ran down the wood line but in the corn and we saw the corn moving but it it was it was at least a foot above the corn if not a foot and a half so it was we, we think it was at least seven feet and it just took off like i've never seen anything move like this in my whole life it was so unbelievably fast and ever since then i've just been fascinated with the subject and wanting to find out more and then after that for a long time actually right after that in the same week my best friend saw it two more times on two different occasions and i'm gonna try and see if i can get him to call in with his story but for a long time after that we didn't really feel safe going in those woods we would go back there with quads and ride around but if we had to like stop and like get a quad to turn back on it was like the scariest five minutes of our lives it was it's weird it's very weird and then that feeling just kind of went away so anyways uh thank you derek for doing the podcast i really really love it i love all the stories i don't feel very distraught by my story but it does make me think twice about going in the woods alone or in just weird areas so yeah uh thanks derek oh i o thank you sir that's a hell of a tale and quite the setting save for the struggling burg of youngstown there's not much up that way 
except maybe some corn, some hills, and the Bigfoot Triangle. There's plenty of room there for a monster, I suppose. Or maybe something passing through. And of course that area is rife with reports of tall, pale, humanoid creatures. Though unlike Truman's, most reports seem to depict the creature as hairless. A good example of this would be the Richard Grebenak video. A video I'd mentioned on past episodes. A video that was filmed outside of Cleveland, Ohio several years ago. This one. Oh my god. I can't believe this. Hey. Hey Mike, I need you. Hey, Carmen, hear you. Alright, you're not gonna believe this. I got it on video now. People think I'm nuts. I got it's on video, it's playing right now. I put the iPad in the window and now this thing's coming up to the steps in my, in my backyard, Mike. What's coming up? It's like a weird demonic looking thing and it's like a human and it's all scratched down. And this is the second time this happened this week. And as I'm talking to you, this is all on recorded and it doesn't see me. I'm in that, you know, that sunroom. Uh -huh. I put the, I've been putting the iPad out as far around and it happened. It's, Weird things been happening around this time at night. Can I record it? You're on record. It's everything's recording now. It's I can see the thing. It's like looking around weird. It doesn't see me. I'm 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 sitting back, but I can still see out the window really good. Now, of course, that was courtesy of Richard Grebenak. And if you haven't seen this video, please go watch it. You already know that the link is in the show notes, so you have no excuse. It's a creepy, creepy video. And this is the kind of video I hope is a hoax. Because we're in some real trouble if this happens to be real. And as you watch, put yourself in Truman's shoes. Imagine seeing something like that over a country bonfire. Well, as Truman mentioned, this event took place near the border with Pennsylvania. And I assume borders mean nothing to cryptids. So I did a little search in the Keystone State as well. And believe it or not, they have their own issues with a pale creature there as well. There are believers out there, people who say they've seen and heard something that's just not quite right. A creature in the woods in Lackawanna County. It came in as an email here at Newswatch 16, a report of, quote, some sort of animal about six to seven feet tall covered in all white fur. The emailer mentioned a wooded area in Carbondale near a mine reclamation site. Not able to resist, we went to find out. You know anything about this? No. You didn't see it? No. Talk was about an albino black bear or Bigfoot. Yeti, anyone? The Summit Garden apartment complex borders those woods. That was our next stop. Maybe a albino black bear or, or Bigfoot or... Have you seen it? No, I haven't. Ready to give up, we found guys who allegedly saw the beast just a few nights ago. Getting someone to talk about that on camera was not easy. <laughs> Come on, you go back in the woods, you see animals in the woods. I don't know where yeah, this let me, story let me, let me try to, Let me try to jog your memory a little bit. <laughs> Damn, you better get up here. There's something up in the woods, we don't know what it is. No? Nobody, you don't remember that? Off-duty Carbondale patrolman Dominic Andadora said he's investigated noises in those woods for the past few years, and now this. My brother was running his dogs back there. Something jumped out of the out of the bushes. They they, they said it was a, maybe a deer, but we don't we don't really know. But it was white, they said, right? Yeah, white with long hair. Now that one was from WNEP, ABC News 16, out of Scranton, Pennsylvania. So maybe Pam and Jim weren't the only ones planning a trip from Scranton to the Youngstown area. Perhaps there's also a pale monster looking for a one-day marriage license. Or maybe I watched too much of The Office. But in all seriousness, these reports span over a number of years. The Scranton area White Bigfoot flap occurred in 2009. Truman's account occurred in 2013 or 14 and the Grebenak video was shot in 2017. Which leads me to believe one disturbing fact. Whatever this thing is, it's likely a permanent resident, not just something meandering through. Now, unfortunately, this is where the trail seemed to go cold. 
Every couple of years, someone in the Rust Belt reports something similar to this. Not often, but often enough to make even the most rational thinker wonder if we truly are alone out in those woods. Now I happen to know the Cleveland area was hit with a few inches of powder this past week. So I pity the folks in Ohio. Good luck finding that thing now. Thanks again, Truman. Go Buckeyes, and be careful out there. That's going to do it for this episode. Monsters Among Us is written and produced by me, Derek Hayes. Additional support is provided by Sarah Carter Hayes and Addie Lloyd. All audio used in this production is done so under the protection of fair use. And if you have a few free moments, please take the time to rate and review us at Apple iTunes or Spotify or wherever they let you do that sort of thing. And while you're at it, be sure to follow us on Instagram, Facebook, or Twitter. The music from tonight's episode was provided by Iron Cthulhu Apocalypse, co.ag music, and Carl Casey at White Bat Audio. And do me a quick favor. Give all of our musical contributors a follow over at YouTube. It means a lot that they allow us to use their tunes for free. So let's repay the favor and get them a few follows. Oh, and while you're there, be sure to follow Monsters Among Us as well. And on that note, thank you so much for listening. And until next week. Okay, I fooked up. I meant to play this call last week, given that it was Easter. But I'm not religious and I don't live near family, so I sort of forgot it was even Easter. Anyway, better late than never. And parents, you might want to screen this one before you let your offspring listen. I certainly wouldn't want to spoil anything. So here, with an encounter with what could only be described as the Easter Bunny is an anonymous caller from parts unknown. All right, brother. Just got introduced to podcast about a month ago, driving an hour and a half to work each way every day and back, of course. So I binge, binge listen. Can't remember how I learned about your podcast, but I love it. And I had a story to tell that I only used to tell my family and they all used to make fun of me. But I heard a story. I can't remember what season it was. But the lady was talking about the tooth fairy. She thought she saw a tooth fairy. It was like a glowing orb or whatever. So when I was a kid, it's back in Texas, I reckon, when I was five, four or five, six years old, I can't remember. It was Easter, and we had to go to bed because the Easter bunny was coming or whatnot. So I was all excited. And at some point, I woke up and snuck back into the living room. And I'm not kidding you, dude. The Easter bunny was standing there. It was like a human-sized bunny putting baskets down. And as I was looking at it, it looked over and saw me. And it, like, put its finger up to its lips, I guess you would call it. And was like, like, don't say nothing. And I went back to bed. And I woke up the next morning. Of course, the Easter baskets were there and all that stuff. And uh, I told my parents about it. And, of course, I got what you would expect now the uh you were sleepwalking you were dreaming whatnot but i can tell you right now i don't have a whole lot of memories from back then but i definitely remember that and i was not dreaming you're not going to remember dreams from four years old unless they're traumatic or something so i knew it wasn't uh, extraterrestrial or a monster or something but once i heard uh, that lady share her story i thought you might like it so love the podcast and uh keep up the good work man thanks one word tulpa if you will it dude it is no dream thank you caller for the fun entry and thank you for sticking around to the end of the program
Have a good night.